Thank you, Ben. Uh, it is my ninth year, and I think your ninth year here as well. When Stephen first told me he wanted to do a 10 day conference, I said, no, and now it's up to 17 days. So it's like, um, used to be in person in, in an event space. And I was thinking who's going to spend 10 days, but then it turned on this beautiful online library, which is magnificent. I'm happy to be participating. Um, I'm going to be sharing some new information for many of you. Uh, I think I'm going to start sharing my screen. I think that uh, many of you know that I've been um, with the Institute for Responsible Technology, uh, IRT, and that we are um, focused largely so far in the past, um, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I'm known mostly for bringing out the health dangers of GMOs and Roundup and promoting organic and non-GMO products. Um, and we're going to be reviewing just a little bit because I feel kind of uh, obligated, in fact, to share with you some information that I've been sharing for years because it's so easy to change people's diet so that they start to eat more organic. Uh, because the data is now so compelling, I would feel remiss if I just went to the new existential threat which many consider to be one of the greatest in the, on the planet and our plans to help mitigate that threat. But first I'm going to just briefly review some of the health dangers solely to motivate you to increase your commitment to eat organic. That's the goal of the next five minutes. Now, I remember traveling around the world and I think at the time it was 25 countries, 2008, whatever. And people would come up to me and say, you know, I can tell when I eat GMOs or not. And I am embarrassed to say that I was, I was skeptical. I was expecting that GMOs would be causing a problem in health, but I thought it would just be showing up in some change in epidemiological, some minor change in epidemiological disease charts, and that we would be able to then find the plausible causative pathway and identify it and verify it in the GMO, take the GMO out of the circulation, and then help fix that particular disease. Now, I was thinking this, even though I was reporting on evidence showing that rats got damaged, major damage throughout their bodies in just 10 days on GMOs. So what was I thinking? When I went to an American Academy of Environmental Medicine conference in 2009, I brought a video camera and started interviewing some of these doctors who had seen me speak there each year since 2006. And they told me that their patients get better from whatever they're experiencing more quickly and sometimes completely just by switching to a non-GMO and often organic diet. Once one doctor said everyone gets better when she puts them on an organic diet. And I went and visited her and interviewed her patients and then uh, wasn't sure, well, there's so many potential co-confounding factors, but then I went to some farmers and interviewed them who had taken their pigs and cows off of GMO soy and corn and put them on non-GMO soy and corn. And they were getting better from the same things that the humans were. So I started in 2012 being bold enough in my lectures to ask people, what have you noticed when you switch to non-GMO and organic diets? And it was overwhelming. And 150 lectures, including medical doctor conferences, um, who were speaking on behalf of thousands of patients each, we saw a consistent pattern. And so we surveyed 3,256 people, asking them what did they notice, and the results are published and peer-reviewed in the International Journal for Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. So, where is this? Oh, looks like that slide was disappeared. Oh, here we are. So here are the 28 different conditions that people reported getting better from in the lectures that I went to, put them into the survey, and here's the percentage of people that reported getting better from those conditions by switching to non-GMO. And most of the people switched to organic or a very high, high level of organic. So when we say non-GMO, 
we could say non-GMO and largely organic. In every lecture that I gave, the digestive disorder improvements was number one, followed by, I combined the question in the audience, increased energy and reduced brain fog. So in the summary, 80 in the survey, 85.2% of the people we surveyed improved in their digestion, 60% over fatigue, and 52% for brain fog. Now, these weren't just minor changes. In fact, if you look through this entire list, we've looked into the details of it because they had a chance to say, you know, somewhat improved, etc. And for example, in the digestive problems, 80% of the people that reported getting better from digestive problems, it was either significant, nearly gone, or completely resolved. Now, most people in the United States eat their weight in GMOs, and so you'd expect that some of these problems might be on the increase when you look at those epidemiological charts, and sure enough, they are. Here's an example of glyphosate sprayed on wheat, corn, and soy. Now, glyphosate is the chief poison in Roundup herbicide. When we look at the changes in these graphs, we sometimes see a plot against glyphosate because Roundup is sprayed on Roundup ready soy and corn, but Roundup is also sprayed on wheat, oats, beans, etc., that are not organic. And a lot of the problems, we don't know whether it's from being consuming GMOs or consuming glyphosate or the more dangerous full formulation Roundup. But I will say that there's more research done on Roundup and glyphosate than there is on GMOs. So we can plot the causative pathways directly from the qualities on, and features and modes of action of Roundup and glyphosate to these particular diseases. So here we have a, a liver cancer going up in a similar way, in a similar increase to the amount of glyphosate on wheat, corn, and soy. Very high correlation. Now, I'm going to show you a number of these charts, and I want to emphasize the correlation does not prove causation. But we have so many other data points supporting a cause and effect that these are kind of outstanding and astounding to look at. So I'm just going to flip through some of the charts quickly, and I'll read the disease and you can look at the, at the correlation. We have celiac disease, birth defects, newborn metabolic disorders, newborn blood disorders, insomnia, lymph disorders, acute kidney injury, inflammatory bowel disease, we have, we have so many charts. Usually I go through over 30. I'm just going to tell you that we have similar charts, deaths from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, obesity, hypertension, acute myeloid leukemia, intestinal infection, kidney failure, stroke, senile dementia, and disorders of lipoprotein metabolism. Those are the amount of deaths in the United States going up in parallel with either the increased use of GMO, soy and corn, or the increased use of Roundup on those crops or both. There's also an increased incidence of hepatitis C, peritonitis, dementia, anemia, anxiety, schizophrenia, suicide by overdose, ADHD, skin disorders, autism, and diabetes. Again, moving in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup. Newborn disorders, and these are things that we hadn't shown before, of the genitourinary tract, lung conditions, skin conditions, and eye conditions, and cancer of the liver and bile duct, kidney and pelvic, urinary and bladder, thyroid, and breast cancer. So it's an enormous list. And if we were talking this whole time about the health dangers of GMOs and Roundup, we would point out what it is about GMOs and Roundup that can lead to these particular diseases. We would talk about the animal feeding studies. We talk about some of the individual clinical experiences and, and the reports from doctors. But instead, I'm going to leave you with the movie Secret Ingredients. You can, you can rent it at secretingredientsmovie.com. In 80 minutes, you get the whole picture. We track 12 people that switch to organic, 
autistic kids are no longer on the spectrum, infertile couples have children, people who had skin conditions and brain fog and cancer, etc. We have doctors explaining these are common results in their practices, and we have scientists explaining why, we're illustrated by uh, animations that show what happens in the body. So if you are interested, if I haven't yet convinced you to eat more organic than you have, or you want to convince those friends of yours that have been holdouts or members of your family who will run away next time you talk about diet, this is the film to show them. So now I'm going to get to the main part of my lecture. I had to do that because I felt like some of you may have been struggling with diseases or know people who have any of those diseases and many more, and this information may have inspired you for your own case or for others to make a change, and I didn't want to spend the first part of my lecture ignoring that because it can change your life. So by getting the information out to the world, uh, we have convinced 51% of Americans and 48% of consumers worldwide that GMOs are dangerous. And many of those people are seeking non-GMO and ideally organic foods. And in the GMO space, it's driving companies to get rid of them. So after 25 years focused on consumer behavior, now we are pivoting because there's a bigger issue. When you release a GMO, you cannot recall it from the environment. It can be passed on generation to generation. And in the past, the number of GMOs being introduced was rather small. There's about a dozen, or maybe 13 or 14 GMO crops now, depending on with some of the new approvals in other countries have been, have been uh, released yet. But we're now introducing gene editing. Gene editing is a new form of creating genetically engineered crops. And it is cheap. And it is easy. And this means that the number of GMOs that could be introduced, not only into our food supply, but into the environment, can be catastrophically large. Now, one thing about GMOs, including genetic gene editing, is that it's prone to side effects. The most common result of genetic engineering is side effects. Now, the biotech industry wants to pretend that it's new gene editing is safe and predictable and just like breeding. And they've convinced governments, uh, some, in some cases, to turn a blind eye. But I'm going to share with you the real truth about gene editing. I'm going to describe seven things that can go wrong. You'll see scissors on the screen. Gene editing, like for CRISPR, has two components. It has a genetic molecular scissors, and it has a guide that looks for a match along the genome. When it finds a match, the scissors can cut. The first problem is there are many things along, many places along the genome that are very similar to the target, either exactly the same or similar enough to cause cuts in the wrong place. You can have hundreds of cuts up and down the genome from this process. And that means you are making changes that were not part of your predicted model throughout the genome. Now, once you've cut the gene with your tools, it's the cellular mechanism that repairs it. And you have no control as a scientist over how it's connected. You hope it's connected in a certain way, but it can cause deletions and additions and scrambled genetic information reversed. It can cause all sorts of problems in the repair. So you'll see on the screen a little red section. That's kind of a Pandora's box as to what it's actually going to be. And it's often it's outside the control of the scientists. Now, sometimes in the case of something called chromothripsis, the gene editing shatters the chromosome, which when it gets reformed through the genetic repair, it can be completely scrambled. 
There can be large sections of the chromosome missing, and chromothripsis is linked to cancer. Now, when they gene edited mice, they inadvertently put in genes from cows and goats. Now, they weren't intending to, and they didn't bring in genes from cows or goats, so how did it happen? The serum that's used in the Petri dish to house the genome of the mouse they were working on, the serum was from goats or cows. And there were little pieces of DNA floating around in there. So when the CRISPR cut the genome, it just grabbed DNA from nearby and stuffed it in. So now there's retroviruses from cows and goats and other material in the mice completely accidentally. And when they were working to create hornless cows, cows without horns, they said, oh, the horns, it worked perfectly because the offspring have no horns. Let's create a herd and, may, and replace the natural cows. It turns out two years later, someone from the FDA happened to be just testing a software program they had all the data from the so-called perfectly gene edited cows and found that bacteria that was used to smuggle in the gene editing equipment into the cow's cells had ended up being stuffed into and integrated into the cow gene genome. And these particular genes were designed to create antibiotic resistance. So that means if you ate these cows, you might be exposed to pathogens that picked up these antibiotic resistant genes, and you might end up with a serious, perhaps deadly disease. So when this came out, they killed the herd, but it's an example of one of the problems of gene editing. Now, there were mushrooms that were genetically gene edited to knock out the gene that causes browning. So you can slice the mushrooms in advance, sell them as sliced mushrooms, and no one knows that they're genetically engineered because they don't have to be labeled as such, but they won't turn brown. So they lie about their age. They're like Botox mushrooms. Now, when the company sent a letter to the USDA asking, do you need to review this? USDA said, nope. See, they, they don't pay attention to gene edited stuff unless under very, very rare conditions. So this loophole in GM food regulations means that these mushrooms could be introduced at any time. Now, two years or so later, after this abdication and this letter saying, but we don't have to look at it at all, a study was done on knocking out genes, which was the same technique used in these crispr mushrooms. And it turns out knocking out genes only works one third of the, uh, and actually has mistakes about one third of the time. It fails one third of the time. And in some of those cases, the genes that are supposed to be knocked out continue to produce proteins that are truncated, that are not the full protein. They're smaller, they have a different shape. And truncated gene, truncated proteins are known to call, potentially cause allergens and toxins. So no one in the United States had to review these gene edited mushrooms. They approved it without anyone looking to see if the protein was in fact completely knocked out or truncated. And if it had been introduced into the marketplace, it could cause serious diseases or death, potentially. Now, another way that gene editing causes problems is when you put the gene editing equipment into the cell, you can use a gene gun or you can smuggle it in with bacteria. That process creates insertion mutations throughout the, the genome. Now, once you have inserted your gene into a plant, you then clone that plant, clone that, clone that into a plant. So you insert it into a cell, you clone those cells into a plant. The process of cloning creates massive numbers 
of mutations, hundreds or thousands. And so that's another way that you're creating problems that, are, that don't come from natural reproduction. Now, many people have heard of epigenetic changes. In addition to changing the genome consciously and intentionally so that offspring inherit the new gene structure so that you create a plant and then all future plants, for example, or all future animals or mosquitoes, etc., are also genetically engineered. There are changes to gene expression which are often completely unpredictable. And these too can be passed down from generation to generation. So you can, you can turn on a silence gene, you can increase an allergen, a carcinogen, a toxin, inadvertently in your gene edited organism and their offspring and their offspring and their offspring will have the same unpredicted change. And this was tested in mice and that inherited epigenetic change lasted for 10 generations. That's when they stopped checking. So it could be far more than that. When a letter in Nature described the results of CRISPR gene editing of a human embryo, they described it in the title of their letter as chromosomal mayhem. Massive deletions, missing chromosomes, insertions. It was a complete disaster. And when you're thinking about human gene therapy or genetically engineering humans, the scientists pay very careful attention to the sequences that they create through gene editing. But the, in agricultural biotechnology, they typically ignore the sequence of the genes. They ignore changing expressions of other genes through epigenetic effects. They ignore protein, uh, whether they're intact or not. All they want to know is if the agronomic trait that they're trying to get make it round up resistance, make it so it doesn't turn brown. If that works, they'll put it on the market without doing the safety testing. And so the issue is it's an extremely dangerous practice. And yet industry has convinced so many governments to deregulate gene editing or certain categories of gene editing in the United States, Australia, the UK, Brazil, Argentina, Japan. They're putting pressure on the UK now, on, on the EU, and on Canada. And we need to stop this because if you imagine how quick, cheap, and easy gene editing is and how it's prone to side effects, and how once you release these GMOs into the environment, you cannot recall them, future generations will be at risk for our folly of replacing nature. This generation's mandate, now that we have a technology that can so easily redirect the streams of evolution for all time, we must protect all living beings and all future generations. It is the mandate of this generation because we are the ones that, have, that are around when this technology has become available. It may have been totally inevitable that the technology was going to be in the hands of human beings, but it's in the hands of companies like Monsanto Bear that have no regard for safety and humanity. And with the governments being convinced by people, by groups like Monsanto Bear, they now allow gene edited kits on Amazon. Last I checked, it was $169. Now, if you spend a one or 2,000, you'll have the ability to buy by mail order for the price of dinner, a particular input to create yet a new gene edited organism. So it will be used in biology, high school biology classes, college biology classes, home kits all over the world. Millions of gene edited organisms could be introduced. So where do we start? When we looked at GMO 2.0, we realized we cannot rely on changing consumer behavior in order to stop it because there's mosquitoes being released 
there's grass, there's trees, all sorts of things that will be unaffected by your choices in the supermarket. So we looked at what the strategy could be, and we considered this question, which GMOs carry the greatest threat? Think about it. I'm gonna give you only 10 more seconds, so think about which organisms carry the greatest threat to, to the earth. The answer is the microbiome. Oops, there we are. The microbiome is the bacteria, the viruses, the algae, the fungus, archaea, that are like the micro Jedi army that works on our behalf inside us and around the world. It is so important that there's, it's co-evolved with humans for so long that there are intricate, awe-inspiring mechanisms set up to create a healthy microbiome in newborns. In the second trimester, milk digesting proteins enter the birth canal to inoculate the newborn. About 27% of the newborn's gut bacteria comes from the milk. So the milk has a specific formulation. The skin on the nipple of the mother provides about 10% of the microbiome. So the mother's passing on the microbiome from the birth canal, from the milk, from the skin. And, so, and a good portion of the milk is entirely undigestible by the infant. That is not a design flaw. These oligosaccharides are designed to feed the microbiome. They are undigestible by the stomach, by the small intestine. They're designed to get to the large intestine to feed the microbes. And here's what's really interesting. The saliva of the infant has a microbiome. When the infant nurses or breastfeeds, then the information about the health status of the infant is conveyed back to the mother through the microbiome, which could theoretically change the formulation. Hey, Jeffrey Smith, sorry to interrupt you. Um, your mic has a little bit of, of uh, feedback for some reason. All right, let's try moving it closer. How's that? Is that better? Um, maybe move it a little further away. All right. Uh, is, there, is, is there a power button on, on the mic? Uh, I can uh, power it off and power it on. How's it doing now? Yeah. Can you, can you power it off and power it on? All right. How's that? It's better. Thank you. It's feeding. Starts feeding the, the, the default. The default. So try, let me try. Do test one, two, three. Test one, two, two three. Two, three. Uh, we're getting some feedback with that. Um, you, All right. Can, can, All right. You turn, turn the turn the turn the uh, other mic you had on before. Yep. Here we go. So it's not as good a sound, but ultimately, it's not going to drive you crazy with the feedback. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. We last left our infants uh, breastfeeding and re and exchanging information with the breast the nursing mother. Now, all of this is set up because creating a healthy microbiome in the infant can affect the health of that person for the rest of their lives and be passed on to the next generation. If you end up like cesarean birth, etc., or have some problem with the establishment of the microbiome, even the lack of breastfeeding, all of these can affect the microbiome, uh, the, the balance of it, and that could influence one's health for the rest of their lives. But it's not just in terms of newborns. It turns out that we are outsourcing 90% or so of the metabolic and chemical reactions to the microbiome. We can get away with a measly 23,000 genes because we use the 
genetic information of the 3.5 million genes in the microbiome living inside us. There are microbes that do things that our, our cells cannot. And we've outsourced it, and we're fine with that. And the microbiome has the capacity to even cause us to want to eat a cupcake. It'll cause us to want to eat sugar if that will feed the microbiome. It'll cause us to want to be more social if it wants to, to receive more microbiome input from others. When, it's, when we're doing things that the microbiome likes, it can release dopamine into the reward center so that it's training us, reinforcing us for the uh, work that we're doing on its behalf. Now the human microbiome is complex and the soil microbiome may even have more microbes in it and is very similar to the human microbiome. And the microbiome in the soil is critical for uh, drawing down carbon, incre increasing nutrients in the plant, um, for uh, soil uh, water retention, for staving off insects, and for changing, you know, reducing the weeds. It's absolutely essential, and it's being used in regenerative agriculture for all sorts of positive things. Now. What are the risks of genetically engineering the micro? In the film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, which you can see at protectnaturenow.com or at responsibletechnology.org, in the 16-minute film, we introduce some microbes that could, do, that could create cataclysms. In one case, a microbe that was genetically engineered to produce alcohol from plant matter was supposed to be distributed to farmers. Farmers were going to be mixing their crop residues with this bacteria and it would turn into alcohol in these big barrels that can then feed their tractors and they were then to, to spread the nutrient-rich sludge onto their farms afterwards as fertilizer. But as you'll see in this film, I think your your uh, mute your microphone is not muted yet. Thank you. When you you will see in the film that if they had actually done that, they would have probably resulted in sterile fields, unable to support any crops. And it turns out that microbes spread. So I asked Elaine Ingham, who was the PhD, uh, uh, the, she was the professor who had a PhD candidate doing the research that discovered the problems with this um, microbe. What would have happened if it spread around the world? And she said it could have ended terrestrial plant life on the planet. There's another microbe you'll see that might have altered weather patterns. Now, the microbe that was designed to create alcohol was approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. It had passed all of the studies that was required, and the group that was going to release it had no, had no government reason why not to. And the graduate student who was doing research on it was simply doing something for his own PhD dissertation, and it wasn't asked for by the group that was going to release it. And when he came into his laboratory one Saturday morning and realized that all of the wheat plants that he had planted on soil that had been mixed with this bacteria had, were dead and turned to alcohol, that's what stopped this group from releasing their bacteria in an open field two weeks later. Two weeks later, they were going to release it to see how far it could spread on their own. But Dr. Elaine Ingham told me that she found out from EPA whistleblowers about a secret study that the agency uh, had conducted that verified that when you release GMO bacteria in one place, it can travel around the world. Which means that her plausible potential outcome of ending terrestrial plant life on the planet was a possibility. 
So those are bad actors, as you'll see in the film when you watch. But it's crazy to release any genetic, genetically engineered microbe. It's absolute madness. Because microbes travel. Now, the microbe that was going to be released in, this, in the film was going to turn plant matter into alcohol. Just doing what it was supposed to be doing, if it did it all over the place, it could be a disaster. We know from the pandemic that microbes travel. We didn't need the pandemic to know that. And we didn't need the pandemic to know also that microbes mutate. So you genetically engineer a microbe to have a particular effect. And then it mutates, and it can have a completely different effect. But it's unrecallable. In addition, microbes, having trouble with this advance. Here we go. Microbes swap genes. That means that if you genetically engineer something into one microbe, it can send that gene into a hundred or a thousand different species. Now you have a hundred or a thousand different microbes replicating, mutating, swapping genes with other microbes, and traveling around the world. When they enter different ecosystems, they can permanently damage or collapse those. And we don't know, we cannot predict what the impact will be. Most of the microbes in the microbiome are totally unevaluated, unidentified, never cultured. We are just learning of the intricate ways that the microbiome supports life and how it's the foundation how it carries programming that we never thought was possible. There's a person that received a fecal transplant. They received fecal matter from a donor who was healthy. This, this woman was athletic, but she had terrible uh, irritable bowel. She got the new fecal matter. Her irritable bowel symptoms cleared up, but now she's starting to gain weight. They found out that the donor has a history of being obese. So the programming of obesity was passed on. There's a person I know in my film, um, Secret Ingredients, there's David Perlmutter. He told me about a fecal transplant to one of his patients who was, uh, I think, a 12-year-old autistic boy from a healthy uh, girl in her neighborhood. They set it, set it up through a hospital in England, got the fecal transplant. Within two weeks, he was talking in full sentences. You can transfer diseases and health thin or, or, or fat, you can translate, you can transfer all sorts of programming from the microbiome just by transferring fecal matter from human to human, from rat to rat, etc. And this has been verified over and over again. And the, it's a, such a sensitive thing that 80% of human diseases find their source in dysfunction or dysbiosis of the microbiome. So what happens if once the Monsanto Bear Project Join Bio releases a microbe that's genetically engineered throughout the Midwest to fix nitrogen, and it ends up in the infant microbiome or in adult microbiome or in Saudi in the um, in the Sahara Desert or in the rainforest, and it's not just their particular microbe that's carrying those genes; it's now a hundred or a thousand different microbes. We can't predict what will happen, but we are playing with the nature of nature in a way that's irreversible and profound. Therefore, we must lock it down. But on top of all of that, on top of all of that, the process of creating that genetically engineered microbe may create all sorts of side effects. So even the thing that we're releasing in the environment may have changes that we don't know and have not yet investigated. So how do we lock it down? And that was the question that we at the Institute for Responsible Technology asked ourselves. We had pioneered a movement 
I had worked on it for 25 years. We grew it around the world. When I started, no one was talking about the health dangers of GMOs other than three or four sentences. And I realized that they were leaving a lot on the table by, by just focusing on the environment or patenting or farmers' rights. None of the NGOs wanted to touch health. But it was the health dangers that got that moved the needle, created the tipping point. So we at IRT were used to creating new messaging for the world and creating a new movement. So that's what we're up to now, creating a new movement to protect nature now. And in order to do that, we have to focus on three targets. We need laws. Again, consumer choice isn't going to make it. We need to stabilize the understanding of the dangers of genetically engineered microbes to start with popular culture and e academia. Government laws are not enough. I remember being flown to, by the government of Poland years ago to give a press conference with their Minister of Environment. I praised their country's non-GMO policies, but one week later, a pro-GMO government was voted into place. Similar thing happened in Thailand. So we can't rely on government laws alone because they can change with regime change and with special interests. We have to embed an understanding in collective consciousness that we have the responsibility to protect all living beings and all future generations. Now, fortunately, there are other movements who rely on healthy microbiomes. Regenerative agriculture, extremely important to draw down carbon, to improve the quality of crops, to renew and build our soil, which supposedly has 55 growing seasons left, to overcome the need for farmers to use any pesticides, including fungicides, herbicides, insecticides. Regenerative agriculture relies on the microbial activity in the soil to do the heavy lifting. There's interest now all over the world in regenerative agriculture. But if we start releasing microbes anywhere in the world, it could theoretically destroy the ability for soil microbes to sequester carbon, to hold water, etc., etc. Environmental conservation. There are groups that are buying up and protecting rainforests and pristine lands around the planet. But these can be wiped out if their microbiome becomes imbalanced from genetic engineering. Same with oceans. The algae in the oceans, they are really the lungs of the planet with 70% of the oxygen. They're now genetically engineering algae. There's multi-billion dollar plans to use genetically engineer, engineered algae to create biofuels. But what if that changes the metabolism of the algae in the ocean? But algae also swap genes with bacteria. So all bets are off. We don't know if we are going to be choking off the oxygen supply through the oceans. Invasive species, GMO microbes are invasive species on steroids. They multiply at fantastic rates. You can't see them, you can't recall them, and they can appear in all the ecosystems of a particular jurisdiction. Human health, we've already discussed, even national security, because someone could accidentally create a devastating biological weapon or a devastating way to destroy uh, ecosystems in our future. So we, as the, as the Institute for Responsible Technology, are reaching out to these organizations, to these movements. And if you're a member of that movement, please connect with us and allow us to provide you with educational assets so you too can also call on governments and the humanity to lock down genetically engineered microbes. Now, what's interesting is if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, one of them is the fact that it has alerted the world to the dangers of GM of microbes, period, whether they're genetically engineered in origin or not. I don't need to enter that debate, 
because we know that microbes now can travel the world, mutate, and wreak havoc. Now, there is a discussion uh, that it might be, have been released from a lab, and we don't need to know whether this particular virus was creating in a, created in a lab or not. As you'll see in the 16-minute film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, we introduce gain-of-function research. And there you'll learn about H5N1 avian flu, which has a 52% death rate. And genetic engineers made it airborne in a laboratory. It's very hard to contract this H5N1 avian flu. In a decade, less than 1,000 people have caught it because they were hanging around birds uh, grown in, in um, bird farms for a long time. But scientists made it airborne, which means theoretically it might create a devastating pandemic that can decimate the human population if it escaped. But if you think about biosecurity levels three and four, you might think of them as fortresses that are invulnerable. But over a thousand accidents have occurred and been reported, let alone perhaps many more that have been unreported. There have been releases accidentally of some of the most dangerous pathogens. And so what we've decided to do at Protect Nature Now and GMO 2.0 is to call on not just the ban of the release of genetically engineered microbes, but a ban on the gain of function enhancement of potentially pandemic pathogens. And this, if we just do the ban of gain of function, it's not implementing the lessons that we know about what microbes can do. Because if we release a well-meaning, apparently beneficent microbe, in the environment, it could lead to a pandemic. It could lead to an increase in any one of a number of existing diseases. So we need to be careful in this regard. And because the pandemic has now created a, a global call for greater caution, we can ride that wave and help block all genetically engineered microbes. So this is ultimately an invitation to transform humanity. Many people have had the experience <clears throat> of being diagnosed with a life-threatening disease, and when they pull through, <clears throat> they acknowledge that that disease turned out to be one of the greatest blessings of their lives. And this is the, something that can happen to humanity. We are in a life-threatening situation. <clears throat> We're in a situation where genetically engineered microbes, which can be created by anyone in their basement, could threaten the continuity of humanity and of any living being. And we have just been through a pandemic. We're primed, our receptor cells are open. We need to redefine ourselves now that we have the potential to destroy all living beings. We need to <clears throat> become stewards of nature, to protect the gene pool as if life depended on it, which it does. We need a global vision where everyone holds nature close to their hearts. So it's like a leap forward in collective consciousness. And I understand collective consciousness to be nonlinear and nonlocal, and that leaps forward are possible. And it takes a certain number of people to have that vision and to act according to that vision. And that is why I'm asking you to join the GMO 2.0 movement. We need the most influential, most creative, most brilliant, and most caring people. Please go to responsibletechnology.org and sign up to be part of our list. Go to our Facebook page. Become part of our movement. And we will give you opportunities to reach out to elected officials, to share assets on your social media. We'll give you new information and training. People who would like to become more active locally will be providing those things. We're, built, we're in the movement building stage now. 
the number one most important thing that we can use is financial support. So at responsibletechnology.org, please go to the donation tab and make a recurring donation of any amount that you can afford per month. Because then we will know we'll have that money to count on when we hire people and invest in a particular film or TV series or travel or project. So please join us as a member of the GMO 2.0 movement, and if you can, as a contributor. So I'd like to now ask for questions uh, about any aspect that we've talked about, the genetically engineered microbes, gene editing, and also the health dangers of GMOs and Roundup. Jeffrey, uh, thank you so, so much. As always, this was uh, eye-opening, to say the least, for so many of us. And, uh, and yes, we're looking forward to starting our Q&A. Um, once again, you mentioned different places where folks can get involved. Uh, if they want to find your books, where's the best place to do that? I got a couple behind me. <laughs> um, the books Seeds of Deception and Genetic Roulette um, should be available in many places, although they're old. Um, we have them at seedsofdeception.com. They're being moved, in, their inventory is being moved. So today you won't be able to order, but they'll be orderable uh, in a couple of weeks. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so with that, yes, we'd love to uh, start a Q&A session with you. And thank you for being available for that. I already see a couple of hands raised. I want to make sure for those people that are just joining us for the first time, everybody knows how to ask their questions and how to raise their hands. And so here at The Real Truth About Health, normally we do not take questions directly from the chat box. We ask everyone to raise their hand. And in case you all don't know how to do that, down at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see different tabs. One of those tabs is called a reactions tab. So you click on your reactions tab, a few emojis will pop up. And one of them is the raise hand function. You'll click on that. We'll see your raised hand come in. We'll take raised hands in the order in which they come. How do we do that? I'll call your first name, I'll unmute you, and you will have your question uh, ready for Jeffrey Smith. And so, Jeffrey, if you're ready, we set him up, you down, and we'll go from there. So uh, our first question is coming in from Sharon. Sharon, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Sharon. Hello. This has been so interesting. Um, I've been told that all organic food is non-GMO. Is that true? And if a person cannot buy all organic food, which of the ones should they absolutely avoid that aren't organic? Thank you, Sharon. Great question. Organic products are not allowed to intentionally use GMOs. Sometimes there's contamination. On some occasions, there's fraud, but it is the category of food that is most trusted and widely available. They do not require testing to see if there's been contamination from genetically engineered sources. The non-GMO project has a little butterfly seal that does require testing to make sure that the production reliably achieves below their 0.9% contamination threshold. But if you get something that says non-GMO project verified, it does not mean that it's not been sprayed with Roundup. So you can get genetically a non-GMO wheat. Wheat has never been genetically engineered. Um, at least, well, actually it's gonna be available this year in, in Brazil, unfortunately, um, or oats. Oats are sprayed with Roundup very often, drenched in Roundup, high levels of glyphosate residues, non-GMO. So if you see non-GMO project verified on there and you taste it and you eat it, it might be poisoning you with glyphosate. Now, if you so if you had to choose between organic seal and non-GMO project verified, go for organic. If you have both on the label, then you have the benefit of organic, which is not allowing glyphosate or Roundup, and it's not allowing GMOs. And with the non-GMO project 
seal, if it has any at-risk ingredients, it's been tested. And so that's actually the gold standard. Now, if you can't get organic, at least get non-GMO, and then learn to avoid the particular foods that have high levels of Roundup. If you go to responsibletechnology.org, you'll be given an opportunity to get a report which lists all of the levels of Roundup by food type. It has the food type, and in some cases, it has actual processed foods by brands. And when you look at it, you'll realize that basically the grains and the beans are the, are the big problems. Lentils, mung beans, hummus, because it's got the chickpeas, oats, wheat, some rice. And then it's also found in orange juice because it's sprayed on the floors of the orchards and it's found in wine because it's sprayed on the vineyards. But you'll see relatively how much is there. And you'll get a sense that if you can't eat organic, you don't want to eat the wheat or the oats or the beans. And then maybe there's some others in there that you realize you definitely want, can't get organic, but you need to avoid the Roundup. As far as the GMOs go, we have a list also at Responsible Technology in terms of healthy shopping link that lists the GMOs that are approved, but also the derivatives of them. So soy and corn are perfect examples. They're, der they're genetically engineered, nine out of 10. Their derivatives include things that you wouldn't, that don't have the word corn or soy in. So in processed foods, you can figure out which words to avoid if it's not organic. Now, if it does say organic on the front, then it must be at least 95% organic. But the other 5% has to be non-GMO. It might say 100% organic on the front of the, of the package, in which case it's all organic. If it says on the front instead, made with organic ingredients or made with organic soy or made with organic something, then the entire formulation has to be at least 70% organic, but the other 30% has to be non-GMO. If you look at the, if organic is not on the front of the label at all, but you look at the ingredient panel and you see organic soy, fine. It only means that the soy is organic. If you see canola on the same packaging, that could be GMO. Because if there's no organic on the front, it means they might be using GMO ingredients, even if some of the ingredients are organic. So those are the four ways that organics are listed. 100% organic, organic, made with organic ingredients, or just on the ingredient panel, and you might read organic there. I hope that helps you in with your shopping, Sharon. That was uh, incredibly helpful, and, and not just a, a, a helpful answer, but what a, a great resource for all of us. And thanks for putting that all together for us. Um, really, Jeffrey, amazing. Uh, we're going to move on now to Laura. Laura, I am asking you to unmute. Let's see if that works. Hi, Hello. Laura. Hi. How are you? Hi, Laura. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I, I just wanted to know, because I, first of all, I have zero trust in anything that's coming from the United States government right now, especially since I have, I know I've, I've just I've read who's heading the uh, USDA and the EPA and all this. I have zero trust that my government cares about anything except growing and making money for people that are in this revolving door from all these industries going into government. And and so it's really frustrating to me. I live in New Hampshire. People are just working really, really hard. They don't have time to even learn this. The media never, ever says anything. So I guess my question is, if I got in touch with you, I work for a very small community access television station here in Mount Washington Valley. And my, my boss is wonderful. I interviewed Glenn Merzer. I interviewed um, a, a, a couple of other people. Um, and would you would you be willing to do a little interview with me with via Zoom on my for my local television station? Because the only way to get the public to know these things who are trying to make ends meet is to, to use every available tool and venue, writing letters to the editor, having speakers come and talk. 
I mean, that's the biggest thing is people don't know and they, 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 they trust in a system that has betrayed them and it has been betraying them for many, many, many years. Would you be willing to, if I get in touch with you, come in? I mean, you don't have to come, but just do, do a little uh, Zoom presentation just to like open the door so people can start thinking about these things. Well, thank you for that invitation. We actually have assets that make it even better. We have a library. We have the 16 minute film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle. Uh, we have a film coming out that's going to be describing the side effects from gene editing. Uh, we have a number of other films and interviews and panels that we've created that you can access as a library. So do get in touch with us at the info at responsibletechnology.org. And you can, I mean, my film Genetic Roulette. Uh, was played over 300 times on local PBS stations, um, as well as in major, it was played on prime time in countries around the world. Um, yeah, so we have we have things that are far better than just a, a Zoom interview. Um, and I'd be happy to, to have our office give you access to those. Uh, and for the just everyone, we have a YouTube channel and we have more than 100 I don't know how many we have a lot a lot of different uh footage there i've been doing this for 25 years so some of it's vintage and some of it's brand new now as far as not trusting um the usda is run by tom vilsack who got biotech governor of the year when he was iowa's governor um i think he got it twice and uh, he he is not the one generally that will we rely on to be making the world organic. But organic standards have input from the Organic Standards Board, the NOSB, and there's been some fighting going on because a lot of the organic brands are owned by major companies that might be more uh, motivated by the bottom line than the organic traditions. Um, but I can tell you, we have been able to hold the line against genetic engineering. There was someone, I think he was the deputy commissioner or deputy uh, secretary or undersecretary of USDA in a hearing in the US Congress, talked about how organics should start to look at gene editing and we put out a, a press release about that. They're trying to convince organic eaters that gene editing is safe and it's not really GMOs. So when they say that, it is good not to trust them. It is good to insist absolutely that organics exclude GMOs, exclude Roundup. In fact, it's important to keep organic standards as pure as possible. So we have a lot of power as organic eaters. There's a large number of us, and it's growing faster than other aspects of the food industry. So let's use our power. If you get a, a request for a petition or a request to contact your member of Congress, etc., that's one that would be worthwhile doing. And in the meantime, I do have confidence in the organic seal. It requires third-party verification from a non-governmental source, you'll see the certifying organization, going with the standards established by the USDA in, consult in consultation with the organic community. So there have been small amounts of fraud, there have been levels of contamination, but it's still our best bet. Thanks, Jeffrey, very, very much. Um... We are going to move on now to Evelyn. And hi, Evelyn. Welcome. Hello. Um, other speakers have talked about the fact that the pharmaceutical industry is actually funding our government agencies, particularly the FDA, the CDC, and the NIH. And we have seen that certain powerful heads of those agencies are in charge of dispersing that money uh, and they're dispersing some of those that pharmaceutical money 
to gain a function research. And I'm concerned that the pharmaceutical industry, that that pattern of the pharmaceutical industry funding things, uh, it might be spilling over to the um, uh, USDA. So can you talk about whether the pharmaceutical uh, funding that's going to gain a function research might be infiltrating the USDA? Is the USDA also taking funding from uh, the pharmaceutical companies? Are the pharmaceutical companies trying to infiltrate big food and should be worried about, would be worried about uh, lobbyists and the USDA? That's a lot to unpack, Evelyn. I'm going to make a note because there's about five things in there. There's gain of function. There's regulatory capture. There's uh, USDA on their research and probably some more, which I didn't uh, get down. So first of all, it's not just the money that goes going to the FDA that corrupts it. Um, there's the political appointees put at the top um, are in charge and they follow a political agenda, not a scientific one. So when the first Bush administration wanted to fast track GMOs, they told the FDA, promote GMOs, find a way to get it out there quickly with no regulation. And so the FDA created a position, deputy director of, of policy for Michael Taylor, who was Monsanto's attorney, outside attorney. And he had worked with Monsanto and a group of biotech companies before that to create a government framework where it was designed to get GMOs on the market with as little government oversight as possible. So when he was in charge of policy at the FDA, that's when the GMO policy was created. And he said in his policy, which he wrote, uh, that the agency is not aware of any information showing that GMOs are different from other regular foods in any meaningful way. Therefore, no labeling is necessary, no safety testing is necessary. In fact, companies like Monsanto don't even have to tell the FDA if they want to put it on the market. After releasing that in 1992, Michael Taylor became Monsanto's vice president. And then later, under Obama, he went back to the FDA as the U.S. food czar. Now, when, the doc when documents were made public from a lawsuit in 1998, six years after that policy was put into play, we realized it was entirely a fraud. The agency was aware that GMOs were different and dangerous. It was the overwhelming consensus among the scientists at the FDA. And they had urged their superiors to require long-term studies, but they were ignored by the person in charge who denied the existence of those concerns. Similarly, the EPA, which evaluates and approved Roundup or glyphosate, the recent trial, the Roundup trial, showed how Monsanto had their own lapdogs in the EPA. Jess Rowland, for example, who was in charge of the EPA committee that determined that glyphosate doesn't cause cancer. Well, the World Health Organization determined that it probably does. And they used peer-reviewed published studies. And they used not only studies of glyphosate, but the full formulation. Jess Rowland limited his committee's review to almost exclusively Monsanto studies. And Monsanto rigs their research. How do they rig their research? I have evaluated that for years with scientists, capturing, ca ca hmm, catching them red-handed. And I knew so many of the ways that Monsanto rigged research, but a new one came out during the trial. When they wanted to show that a certain amount of, of Roundup was absorbed into human skin, less than what was needed. They first took a human cadaver, cut the skin away, added Roundup, and found too much of it was absorbed, over three times the allowable level. So they took new human skin and 
baked it in an oven, then froze it. So then they applied Roundup to this leather-like, baked and frozen human skin. Hardly any Roundup was absorbed. They reported those figures to the EPA and not the figures on a normal cadaver skin. And this is typical Monsanto style. So we cannot trust Monsanto research. Now, getting to gain of function. A lot of the sources of gain of function money are Department of Defense. Um, when the Cold War expenditures went down, they could shift some of their expenditures to gain of function. And some of that gets dispersed through um, Anthony Fauci's organization in, within the NIH. There was, when the H5N1 avian flu was engineered to be airborne by two separate laboratories, it created a, an alarm among scientists around the world who were shocked, describing it as crazy, insane, stupid. Because they knew that ferrets, which are stand-ins for humans in gain-of-function research, they could catch this pandemic disease now through the air. And what if it escaped? What if humans could also catch it through the air? The death rate was 52%. An earlier view looked at it 60%, but let's just say 52%. That could be devastating to the human population. Why create these in labs where a single accident could be a disaster? So in 2016, 2014, the Obama administration put a partial ban, but they had some loopholes. So money was still able to fund it, even though there was a ban on gain of function in the United States. That was overturned in 2017 under the Trump administration. So now there's a small handful of scientists in a very obscure but serious area of science that could destroy it for all of us. And whether the money is going from the pharmaceutical industry or more of it for likely from the Department of Defense for so-called dual function research, we want that banned completely. I don't know if the USDA is doing any gain of function research. I haven't heard of any. I'm not an expert at it, so I'll leave that to you to find out if it's important. Thank you very, very much for that, Jeffrey. And um, at the moment, I don't have any other raised hands. And I, 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 folks, this is a great opportunity to pick Jeffrey Smith's brain. So uh, we'll give you a few more minutes, please. We'd love to see more raised hands. And in the meantime, Jeffrey, I've got tons of questions I'd love to ask you. So thank <laughs> you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, you know what? I, I, instead of how about I just fire a bunch of stuff at you and just ask you to comment on them? I think that a lot of this you've covered, but we can drive the points home and maybe you'll even find ways to uncover things you haven't spoken about. So there's something going on right now, and that's a an approval by the EPA to release two and a half billion mosquitoes in Florida and California. So um, I remember um, arguing with one of the scientists at the company that makes these mosquitoes, Oxitec, back in 2014. And I told him he was, he could be damaging the very gene pool forever. And you see these mosquitoes are designed to reduce the population. And he, con he considered them self-eliminating because they would give birth to sterile offspring. And he said, there's no way. He said, if you release them, if we stop releasing them by the millions, they'll just go away. Well, a team of scientists went down and collected samples of mosquitoes in the natural population in Brazil three years after Oxitec released millions of mosquitoes. And they found in 60% of their samples, there were hybrid mosquitoes that had genetic information from the local mosquitoes combined with Oxitex mosquitoes. And they were now a permanent part of the gene pool. And we don't know if those mosquitoes are more likely to be carrying disease or harder to kill. So they, he was completely wrong, but completely confident in his 
misinformation. I also asked him, his name was Derek Nemo. I said, Eric, Derek, have you tested the saliva from the female mosquitoes you're creating? They're biting humans because they mostly release male mosquitoes, but ultimately millions of female mosquitoes got through their system. And he said, we're just now testing to see if the protein produced by the inserted gene is found in the saliva. And I'm thinking, he's already released millions of mosquitoes in four countries, exposing the population to these mosquitoes, and he's never tested the saliva. And now he's doing the wrong test. So I said to him, Derek, the process of genetic engineering can lead to massive collateral damage. It can cause changes in gene expression. I told him about a cystic fibrosis study where they took a cell, human cell, inserted a gene, and were shocked to find up to 5% of the, all of the genes that were active changed their levels of expression, producing more proteins or less proteins, turning on or shutting off. I said to him, shouldn't you be testing the full composition of the saliva and not just for one particular protein? I'll never forget his response. He said, good idea. Well, to this day, they've never published compositional uh, research of the saliva that ends up inside human bloodstream from their genetically engineered mosquitoes. They have a 2.0, supposedly, of mosquitoes that are supposedly work better, but the, the research does not support their allegations, and it could be a disaster. They want to release it in 12 California counties and expand their start in the Keys, which started uh, last year or the year before, and introduce far more before even releasing the data of their results in the Keys. When we funded a Freedom of Information Act request into the Cayman Islands to find out what had happened from their trial there, they had claimed that the trial was a success and were asking the government to roll out the mosquitoes island-wide. But we caught them lying because in the Freedom of Information Act requests, it turns out they had failed. It was a complete failure. So when that became public, they quietly left the island and dismantled their, their operation there. So they're, they're, we've been caught red-handed lying about many things, and yet the EPA just went ahead and approved genetically engineered mosquitoes for our gene pool. Looks like there's some hands up. There certainly are, and, and thank you for bringing all that, uh, all of that up as well. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, we're going to go next to Melissa. Let's unmute you. Welcome, Melissa. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, so I try to eat organic as much as I can. If someone has um, unknowingly uh, consumed some products that are GMO um, laced or you treated. Do you have any recommendations for how one might be able to detox? Um, is that even possible to help get whatever that is and whatever it causes out of your system? Yes, I do. Uh, that's a great question. In fact, it was the second most popular question I had in years and years of traveling. And I'd always answer it most of the same way saying, it's above my pay grade. I, I'm not a scientist or a healthcare practitioner. But then I started hearing from practitioners and product formulators and scientists that they had developed ways to detox, repair, and rebuild the body after being exposed to GMOs and Roundup. So I gathered them up and created a little course called Healing from GMOs and Roundup, because although I'm not qualified to answer the questions, I'm more than qualified to ask them. So I asked 18 people, uh, all these great practitioners, you'll see, if you go to livehealthybewell.com, you can see uh, the courses available there, livehealthybewell.com. And I remember talking to Dietrich Klinghart on the interview, and he said, he told me something that I hadn't heard before. He would test the glyphosate in the urine of his patients. And the ones that were the most sick, particularly including autistic kids, had no glyphosate in their urine. He'd start his glyphosate detox, and then the glyphosate would start to be released from their bodies, suggesting that they may have more glyphosate accumulating in their bodies than those that are less sick. 
I've heard that same answer from another practitioner more recently. Um, I've heard there's so many ways that these experts, Dietrich Kinghart, Lee Cowden, Kieran Krishnan, Zach Bush, Joe Mercola, Josh Axe, so many ways that these experts have, with their, with their angles and their tools, addressed your question. It's not appropriate for me to try to summarize and pick what the best is, because I can't. It's best if you watch it and decide what works for you, listen to their logic, and you can also do follow-up research on your own by searching the net. But there's plenty of information in there, whether it's detoxing through uh, saunas and detoxing through uh, building up the, the two-phase detoxification of the liver through particular foods, or create. there's a way of creating fermented foods that's there described by a person who is a nutritionist, a chef, and an inventor. So we got a really group, great group together to help you answer that question. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, up next, we're going to bring in uh, Kaylee. Hi. 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 Thank you. Um, um, Jeff, please, where's the EU at? Do they act as one or do they act as separate countries? And where are they at in terms of their permissiveness um, for all of these things? Well, the EU Commission is pro-GMO. The Euro the European Food Safety Authority, which is like their FDA, is pro-GMO. The, par the parliament, the members of the European Parliament vote against GMOs. So when there's proposals for allowing new crops to be planted in or Europe or new foods to be approved, the parliament will vote no, the European Commission will vote yes. But the countries can block their own growing of GMOs, and very, very few European countries grow GMOs. Spain has a little acreage, if they still do, of, of genetically engineered corn. Romania may have some corn um, or soy, but there's very few countries that grow it. There are no countries that ban the consumption of it, but the food companies back in 1999 and 2000 committed to not use GM ingredients. Not in terms of animal feed, there's only a small number that commit to not use GMO animal feed in their animal products. But in their non-animal products, most of the big retailers that have a lot of power there, as well as the major brands, committed to the Europeans not to give them GMOs. And they have a labeling law, which is far which is a real labeling law, not the fake labeling law in the United States. And you will very rarely find a product that says genetically engineered there because it's, it's rare that it's used. Um, the European Union uh, law, the, the, the judges there, the courts, determine that gene editing should be treated like GMOs. And that really angered the biotech industry. So they got their friends at a German institute and at the European Food Safety Authority to publish things to try and convince the laws to change so that they allow all gene edited GMOs to go without any regulation, without any oversight, without any labeling. So the pressure is on. It's a full court press right now. And we're trying to produce uh, assets that can be used in that fight to um, hold the line in the EU and come back to regulation in other countries where we've already lost. Thanks, Jeffrey. Appreciate that. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, up next we have Sean. Welcome, Sean. Hi, Steve, hold on a second. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. All right. How are you doing, Jeffrey? Thank you for everything that you do. Um, I'd like to know your opinion on the gene therapy injections that are being marketed to vaccines right now? Thank you, Sean. I get asked that a lot, and I'm not an expert at vaccines. I am very well acquainted with genetically engineered foods, and for years people have asked me questions that are outside my expertise, and I decided to create a policy early on 
to stay in my lane uh, for a number of reasons. From a strategic standpoint, I want to keep the bar as low as possible for people to stop eating GMOs. So I give no uh, advice in terms of what to eat other than organic. So someone may tell you plant-based, someone may tell you paleo, someone may tell you Weston Price, someone may tell you um, uh, raw, et cetera, et cetera, macrobiotic. They'll all disagree with each other, but they'll all agree with me. And they can all say, I've, I've seen this at panels in conferences where everyone's fighting with each other, but the audience and everyone on the panel agrees, don't eat GMOs. So we don't take positions on diet. We don't take positions on other areas, like people can ask me about everything else. So um, there are far greater experts and great controversy in the area of the vaccines. And the thing that I can say is that in I haven't heard about these vaccines being tested for it, but the other vaccines that are been tested from the schedule for children, they contain glyphosate. And that we consider to be reprehensible. And we have an idea of how that glyphosate got in there, but it's absolutely a disaster. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I'm now gonna move to Andrea. Welcome, Andrea. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. You're awesome. Could I go back and ask you why do they release mosquitoes in certain countries? And do they release the mosquitoes in the United States? And why yes. It, it's been um, Cayman Islands, Panama, Malaysia, Brazil, and Florida in the Keys. The idea is they're targeting the Aegis aegypti mosquito, which carries dengue fever, Zika, and another disease called chikungunya. And they want to reduce the population of this mosquito in order to theoretically reduce the disease. Where they have released it, there's been no indication that the disease incidence has been reduced. And in some cases, even the population of the mosquitoes has not been permanently reduced. The interesting thing is they have targeted California to release billions of mosquitoes in 12 counties. But my friend, pediatrician Michelle Perro, who's on the panel at Real Truth About Health and the author of What's Making Our Children Sick, she checked with the statistics in California and found 700 cases of these diseases that were mosquito-borne by Aedes aegypti. But they were all from people that caught it outside of California and then came into the state. There wasn't a single mosquito-borne disease from this type of mosquito recorded in the history of California health stats. So there's no reason for it in California. And what it does is it changes the gene pool and exposes people to potential mosquito bites. Now they say they release only the males, but and they claim that they that the females are killed in larva stage and it's the females that bite. But in the release, they in the last time they released, there were plenty of females released accidentally. And it's a leaky technology. It doesn't always work. So the 100% success rate in terms of kill, not true. It could end up creating, and probably does, a vast amount of mosquitoes that bite, that are genetically engineered, that haven't been properly tested to see what the results are for human health. Also, bats and birds, some of them eat mosquitoes. There's no tests to see what the impact will be up down the food chain. And it's a very dangerous technology to release it in insects that bite and fly. I'm just saying that. How profound. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, we've got Evelyn back. Hi, Evelyn, welcome back. Uh, my next uh, set of comments is about regenerative agriculture. 
So I think that's, you know, the wave of the future in terms of us getting more nutrition and that covers the soil regeneration. But I'm concerned about the water sources in the regenerative fields. And so you can't filter glyphosate out of the rain. So glyphosate's falling on the on those regenerative farms. And some of those farms are being irrigated with municipal water, which may or may not include wastewater. And we know that the wastewater can't be filtered for a lot of things, uh, glyphosate, pharmaceuticals, and that kind of stuff. And so I know it must be prohibitive for those farms to have to filter their water. Uh, and so I'm wondering if the regenerative farming is finding microbes that can de degenerate the glyphosate that is inevitably falling on those plants or, or how are we going to uh, solve the problem of the water that's being used in these regenerative farms? That's an excellent question, Evelyn. And it's the first time I've ever heard it. And I've been to, I've given a thousand lectures and a thousand interviews. Good on you for asking that brilliant question. Um, yes, there's glyphosate in the rain. There's glyphosate in groundwater. Um, there's other chemicals as well. What is interesting is that in the regenerative practices that are out there, they're working. So the amount of antimicrobials in water and in rain is not sufficient to destroy these test plots and these ongoing uh, regenerative farms. Now, uh, in the Healing from GMOs and Roundup series, I interview someone who's a testing expert at uh, glyphosate, and it turns out there's most of the testing of, of drinking water uh, was without glyphosate uh, as of three or four years ago. Um, but and that means that some of the water that's used for agriculture probably um, is also clean. But even where it's not, the we are getting hearing amazing results from regenerative practices. Uh, you mentioned increased nutrition. There was a study that came out, I think, this week, where uh, on many farms they tested um, regenerative agriculture practices. Uh, of the same crops that were being grown on the neighbor's farm. So there was regenerative farms and they said, give us an acre and plant this particular thing because your neighbor's planting it so we can test it. And sure enough, when it was planted in the regenerative farm, it was far more nutrient dense than the neighbor who was using chemicals. Um, now the neighbor's using chemicals, there still could be some chemical access to the to the farm, but not enough to destroy the microbiome. Now, from a strategic standpoint, as the value of regenerative agriculture grows and people realize you don't need the pesticide uh, buffet when you have a healthy microbiome, you can stop using GMO uh, seeds, you don't need the Roundup, you don't need necessarily the fertilizers, you don't need uh, the insecticides when you have this healthy ecosystem. So you're, the farmers are making more money. They're using less inputs. They are, the water usage is better. They're now having potentially carbon credits that they can sell because of the drawdown of carbon into their rich soil. Now it provides less motivation for farmers to use Roundup. And it provides more financial motivation to limit the amount of Roundup in the atmosphere and in the, in the water if it is, in fact, causing problems in the microbes that are being used for regenerative agriculture. If we found that small amounts of Roundup were inhibiting carbon sequestration, for example, that could be a cost of using Roundup. It could be devastating to those that are trying to get the carbon credits. And if there's a sufficient number of them, it can be used to create new law. So I always think in terms of, of bigger picture strategies and the fact, as you say, Evelyn, that regenerative agriculture is being used a lot now, it's really on the upswing. I went to DC 
uh, and met with offices of nine members of Congress uh, with Elaine Ingham and Tim LaSalle, both experts in regenerative agriculture, sharing with these members or their staffs um, some of these benefits. And we had overwhelming interest there. Now, why was I there? I'm not an expert in regenerative agriculture. But as you saw from the presentation, regenerative agriculture and protecting the microbiome are great allies. So I was there, we did a live stream in the National Press Club, and I was mentioning to Elaine on the, on the live stream, I'm like water skiing behind regenerative agriculture, holding the insurance policy. Because there's going to be billions invested in regenerative agriculture with a big hope of return. But all those billions need an insurance policy of blocking the release of GMO microbes. Thank you for your question. Thanks very much for that, Jeffrey. Um, we've got a little over 10 minutes left before our next, uh, before our panel tonight. And uh, folks, uh, I'm gonna, I have another question for you, Jeffrey, but uh, before we get there, just a reminder to everybody, let's take advantage. We've got Jeffrey here. So if anybody else has more questions, uh, please do come in. In fact, there's Kaylee. So I'll have Kaylee ask her a question before I get to mine. Um, what do you know? Back. Hi, Kaylee, you're on the air. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to know if it was true that Disney World or Disneyland um, released thousands of ladybugs in order to that they would be, they would be destroying mosquitoes. Is that is that true? And do they do that? I don't know. I never heard that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks very much, Kaylee. Um, so, Jeffrey, I, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. We've had Vandana Shiva here before. And she has mentioned her viewpoint on the role that Bill Gates plays in the global use of GMOs. And I, I'm always been curious to get, if you have a take on that, what would that be? Well, he appears to be really ignorant of basic laws of science. Um, you know, when he releases, or when he was a CEO of Microsoft and he released some software, he would have bugs and you have to go and fix the bugs and the, and those bugs and the software would not necessarily play well with others. So when new software was introduced into the field, he'd have to upgrade and upgrade and fix it before he ever released it. It was tested with great detail under many, many different conditions, thousands of hours sometimes, and still they found problems. Now with genetic engineering, you're dealing with a system that is far more complex and evolving. They don't do nearly any of those tests. I mean, basically, as little as possible to get their foods on the market as quickly as possible. Yeah. I think we have a. We'll right. be on that. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Do you here? Gerald, yeah. Anyway, someone, someone needs to be muted. There we go. So, not only that, but when that organism starts interacting with others, like software in the same interaction with others. Now you have genes interacting, genes transferring, possible mutation, and you can't call, recall it. You can't apply an upgrade, a 2.0 or 3.0, once you put it in the field. Genetic engineering is not rocket science. It is far more complicated. It's biology. And it's interesting that Bill Gates, who is aware of the need to test and upgrade software, ignores the fact that the biotech industry does nothing of the sort with genetically engineered crops and other organisms and can't even do it uh, to the extent that would be safe. He has funded uh, many African projects on genetic engineering. He's funded a... Um, group in Cornell that puts out uh, propaganda in favor of GMOs. Um, he has invested a lot of his money in Monsanto with a turn to bear. His director of his foundation uh, division on agriculture was a former VP of Monsanto at one point. I don't know if he still is, but he's been a uh, rejected. He's been literally hated by so many people in Africa who say he's trying to dictate terms with a technology that's 
very dangerous and inappropriate. So he's wreaking havoc, unfortunately, and what appears to be his well-meaning and misguided mission to use genetic engineering to feed the world. Thank you for, for speaking out on that. Um, I hope I am, we have another question coming in. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, oh, hang on. Is it Tahia? Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you. I can hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Hear okay. um, how safe is it to use colloidal silver uh, in a daily basis? Like prophylaxis? Colloidal silver? Mm -hmm. What's the question? Is, is it safe to use it every day? So colloidal silver is not my area. I have talked to the people who put out uh, sovereign silver and asked them a whole bunch of questions. And, uh, it, it, and I've mentioned it in, in uh, some of my talks or interviews uh, where it met my, my level. I, I presented their expertise. So what happens is I have a criteria. I feel like if a scientist is speaking outside of my area, but they're knowledge is relevant to my audience, they have to pass certain hoops before I introduce them. And then it's up to them to make the claim. So I'm, I'm, uh, I've heard that it's fine to hear, but I'm not going to be the source on that. Thanks, Jeffrey. Appreciate that. Uh, we have another question coming in now from Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have what you would call a micro farm in Delaware. Um, and it's just uh, the open part that I haven't naturalized yet is about six and a half acres. Um, and the people around me farm conventionally, which includes glyphosate and commercial fertilizers, so on and so forth. And I'm just wondering if you have a feel for how far off the property line I can trust that the things I plant and grow using natural methods, which includes uh, collected horse manure from my neighbors, things like that, um, how much can I trust that they are in fact organic? Well, it's an interesting question. I don't know how far glyphosate spreads underground, but it does. Um, and I don't know about the water flow from the rain from farmers to you. The manure, um, if you put straight manure on, horses are fed um, GMO feed sometimes, um, grains like maybe corn and soy, sugar beet pulp, uh, oat, not oat, um, what is it, uh, canola seed, uh, cotton seed meal, uh, sometimes they, they graze on alfalfa, which could be genetically engineered. So they could have genetic engineered DNA in the, in the manure. So if you put it in compost first and you do it right, it should destroy all the DNA. Um, same thing with chicken manure. It contains glyphosate typically, uh, unless it was raised organic. If the horses were raised organic, it should be fine. Um, <clears throat> when you use the word organic, Organic is a technical certification that's not based on testing. So it's, I think your question is, is it gonna be safe? If you have an organic farm and you follow the organic requirements, they have particular buffer zones, et cetera. Then even if there is some contamination underground or from the rain, you can still call it organic, but it will probably be a very low level of contamination. There are some biological remedies to clean up the glyphosate that sticks around in the soil. I haven't made it available to public yet. I haven't done the interviews with the people who are doing the tests and whatnot, but I'm, I've reached out to them and that should be available soon. So if your farm had been sprayed with Roundup from a previous owner, then the longest recorded half-life of glyphosate residues under certain rare conditions was 22 years, uh, which means after 22 years, only half the glyphosate is degraded. But usually it's many months or a few years for the, for the half-life to occur. Um, but I, I don't know if there's been any tests 
about flow of glyphosate from one farm to another in terms of how far? It's a great question. I wish I knew more. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. Uh, we have another question coming in now from Sharon. Let's go back to Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi. I personally know that the lawsuit against Monsanto was successful, but I don't understand why it's still on the shelves and why farmers are still using it. Can you explain that? <clears throat> the biotech industry, Monsanto Bayer in particular, have captured regulatory agencies all over the world. And they, in 2015, when the World Health Organization, their cancer committee determined that glyphosate causes cancer or probably human carcinogen in humans and definite cancer causer in animals, um, they, Monsanto had been told in advance about that committee's review of glyphosate by their, their lapdog in the EPA, Jess Rowland. And then they uh, documents made public from the lawsuit showed that they had mounted a huge campaign to discredit the WHO. And they then bolstered their support in the EPA, which opposed and came up with an opposite conclusion using unscientific, nonsensical science to say that glyphosate doesn't cause cancer. And they have their own captured regulatory agencies around the world where um, it's basically a Monsanto people who made the determination or groups that if they reverse themselves now, they'll have a lot of egg on their face and more so they may be liable for wrong decisions made in the past. So while the World Health Organization said one thing, these regulatory agencies owned and, owned and operated by Monsanto say other things. In the courtroom, however, they couldn't censor the cross-examination of real experts. The experts that Monsanto Bear brought in, they were not experts at, in the areas needed for human health from glyphosate. The ones who were really the experts, the world experts were there speaking the truth. And the juries were absolutely convinced that glyphosate supported the cancer of the plaintiffs. And they awarded them compensatory damages. <clears throat> but they also were aware that Monsanto had spent decades lying to the public, hiding evidence, rigging research, and ignoring serious health issues among their own employees and their customers. So the juries were furious and awarded huge punitive damages, as much as $2 billion in one of the lawsuits, although that was reduced by the judge. The Several of the big box stores have in fact pulled glyphosate based herbicides and that's mostly been through um, customers or the general public um, asking them to. So if you get a petition uh, for asking a big box store to get rid of it, please sign it. If you're in a store and you see it being sold, tell them it should be taken off the shelves. And uh, Bayer has now said that in 2023, they are planning, perhaps likely, to remove Roundup from consumer garden use in the United States because of the lawsuits, but not from the commercial division. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you very, very, very much, as always. And uh, folks, that's all we have time for on questions. Thank you for everybody that that came in. Sorry, we didn't. We missed you, Laura, on the last one. But um, wow. Thank you once again for being here this year. Thank you once again for being here today for what you shared. Uh, profound, thought provoking and horrifying. Huh. Uh, you're so good at that, Jeff. <laughs> but really, thank, thank you. Well, ben. <laughs> well, I thank you for being a stand for all of us. And, and that's from the bottom of our hearts. And so I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. Tech team, please unmute our audience. What do you want to say to Jeffrey Smith? Thank you. 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 Thank you.